we have to do is to uh, clarify what's the difference between these two things. Obviously, the I is belonging to this system. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for starting the recording. I just wanted to do that also, but now I don't have to. So, parts of the visual organ system. So, first of all, you have the eyeball. Then you have the optic nerve, which continues with the optic tract, and you also have some accessory organs like the eyelids and the conjunctiva, which is just a mucous membrane on the backside of the eyelid and to the uh, side so surrounding the eyeball. And then you have the uh, lacrimal apparatus for the production of the uh, tear fluid and the drainage of the uh, tear fluid as well. And since with the eyes you have to uh, look at things, so the eye has to focus and it has to be able to uh, to focus on 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 things. So it has uh, some uh, muscles also which are responsible for the uh, movements of the eye. Today's lecture will uh, basically cover the uh, wall structure of the eyeball. And then tomorrow we will finish the talk with the other structures which are found inside the eyeball. So the first thing, I know this is uh, really sounding dumb, but this is the first key thing to understand that the eye has a spheroid shape. So it has a special three-dimensional, very regular uh, spheroid shape. <coughs> and... Uh, if you take a look at this spheroid structure, you can halve it in all three directions. So all three main body axes, the sagittal, the transverse, and the uh, longitudinal axis can be drawn onto the, or, or, or put through the middle of the eye. So all of the planes, the sagittal plane, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, coronal plane, and the transverse plane or horizontal plane, you can halve the eyeball with those. So first of all, let's uh, have the coronal section. With the coronal section through the middle of the eyeball, which is called the equator of the eyeball, you can have an anterior part and the posterior part of the eyeball. Then when you take the sagittal plane, then you have a medial section and the posterior section. This is the vertical meridian actually of the eyeball, which is the mid sagittal plane of the eyeball itself. So it's not the mid sagittal plane of the body, but the sagittal plane in the middle of the eye. Okay. And then you also have a horizontal plane, which is the horizontal meridian. With this, you can have a superior and an inferior half of the eyeball. If you combine all these, then you receive eight pieces, which are called octans. So you have an anterior medial superior, an anterior medial inferior, an anterior lateral superior, anterior lateral inferior. Then you have posterior medial superior, posterior medial inferior, posterior lateral superior, posterior lateral inferior octant. Okay. So if you can understand this, then you will have less problems with understanding how the uh, uh, extraocular eye muscles are inserting and how they move the eye, but we will cover this uh, later. So let's uh, skip to the histologic structure of the eyeball. So you have the following main parts for the eyeball structure. First of all, you have a wall which is made from three layers. The outermost layer, which is made of dense connective tissue, is called tunica fibrosa. It has uh, two main parts. The uh, anterior part is called the cornea, which is uh, completely translucent. And you also have the white colored sclera. So that's the white of the eye. Then the middle layer is called tunica vasculosa, which in the clinical terminology is referred to as uvea. The name tunica vasculosa refers to its having a lot of 
muscles. It is made of loose connective tissue um, and it has lots of vessels. Okay. It also contains some uh, smooth muscle. It also contains quite a lot of, um, of um, melanocytes. But basically it has loose connective tissue as basis with, uh, with uh, specific areas which contain a lot of muscle as well. Then you have the uh, tunica nervosa, the innermost layer, which is also called the retina. But actually in the common tongue, retina is only the posterior part, the optic part, which is actually a very special 10 layered nervous tissue from which the outermost first layer is pigmented epithelium and nine layers of actual nerve tissue. So that's the optic part of the uh, retina. And you also have a blind part or pars cica of the uh, retina, which is uh, found here anteriorly. And this is a double layer pigmented epithelium. Okay, so that's the tunica nervosa. Inside the uh, eyeball, you have the following structures. First of all, you have two eye chambers. The anterior chamber located here in between the iris and the pupil and the uh, backside of the cornea, that's the larger anterior chamber. Then here between the lens and the uh, lens suspensory fibers and the backside of the iris, that's where you have the posterior chamber. You have there a clear fluid, which is called the aqueous humor. Then you also have the lens, which is connected to the middle part of the uh, uh, tunica vasculosa, which is called the ciliary body. And these fibers, the suspensory fibers or suspensory ligaments are called the ciliary zonio, so that's the complete structure and the uh, each and in indi each individual suspensory ligament is called zonular fiber so the complete zonular fiber system is called the ciliary zonule and then the uh, back of the uh, inside of the eye is filled with a very special uh, connective tissue which is called the vitreous body Since it's a visual organ, the eye serves the, uh, the uh, vision, so it is receiving light and it has some refraction, some optic power. The refracting media, so those parts which are responsible for the optic power of the eye are the following. The cornea, the chambers of the eye with the aqueous humor, the lens and the vitreous body. To some extent also the tear fluid is contributing to the refraction of the cornea, but that is um, compared to the others less significant. So the total optic power is, uh, is uh, uh, 60 dioptries, from which the largest point around two thirds, around uh, 40 dioptry is the cornea, which has a fixed focus. So you cannot change, you cannot increase nor decrease the uh, optic power of the cornea. Uh, well, actually, you can with surgery, but that's another story. So it has a fixed focus. And the lens, which has around 20 dioptries uh, maximal power, it can be changed. It is regulated by uh, the uh, nervous system. Okay. You have a special reflex called accommodation reflex to increase the refractive power of the lens. We will cover this uh, in later slides. So if the lens is relaxed, then its shape gets more round and it increases the, uh, the uh, refractive power. Okay. If the uh, lens is more flat, then it is focusing on far object and it has less optic power. This requires, this change of shape requires the uh, lens to be elastic. In the next lecture tomorrow, we will see the uh, structure of the lens and we will talk about this in a little bit more detail. Okay, but uh, in advance, I can tell you that the uh, because of the special composition and structure of the lens, it starts to lose its uh, elasticity, so it cannot change the shape as you age.
So sooner or later, people need glasses for reading. Then in the back side, so there are two more uh, structures which uh, we need to uh, talk about with, with, with this function. First of all, the uh, area where the optic nerve fibers are piercing the uh, sclera. This is the so-called optic disc or optic nerve disc, which is a blind spot since there you are missing photoreceptors and other elements of the retina as well. Only the optic fibers are passing through. And there actually, as they are piercing the, uh, the uh, sclera, you have also a cribriform plate of the sclera there. So small openings are uh, letting the uh, optic fibers through. The second one, which is located laterally to the optic disc, is the yellow spot or the macula or macula lutea in its complete uh, Latin name with a small uh, fovea in its middle. That's the central fovea. This is the area of the so-called sharp or central vision. And this is the area where the uh, light has to be focused by the other refractive media. If the light is not focused exactly onto this point, then you have uh, blurry vision depending on where the focus point is shifted behind or in front that's uh, uh, determining if if you have if you are short sighted or far sighted uh, and that determines what type of 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 glasses so plus or minus uh, dioptric glasses you need i'm not going to talk about this uh, in any more detail because it's not our subject for today. And another thing that we are not uh, going to cover the uh, details of the retina because you will have uh, uh, an extra lecture focusing on this topic only. Next thing is the uh, differences between the axes. So here you have the middle of the eye, that's the anatomical axis of the eyeball. Okay. The axis of the orbit, which is starting from the optic canal and going through the uh, middle of the uh, uh, inlet of the orbit to the front. So that line is uh, not straight and it has around 23 degrees angle with the actual anatomical axis. But the optic axis of the eyeball, so the line of vision, which uh, starts again here from the front and passes through the central fovea to the back. So that's how the light has to be focused onto the uh, central fovea. So that is again a little bit shifted more laterally than the actual anatomical axis of the eyeball. With this introduction, let's uh, move on and start to talk about the uh, histologic composition of each and every part. If you are unlucky enough to uh, receive the eyeball as your histologic slide for the final exam, we usually ask you to give a general introduction of what parts of the eyeball uh, you are aware of, and then we are uh, picking one of those topics and uh, you have to present them in, in detail. So uh, you don't have to talk about every part of the retina that would, or every part of the eye, including the, uh, the, uh, the uh, topics which we will go through now. So all, not all of them, because it would take ages. So we usually pick one or two of these uh, parts. And usually, either the retina or the cornea or the iris ciliary body and the uh, angle of the chamber. So these are the uh, highlight points usually which you have to focus on. So uh, if you are short of time, focus on these objects to learn them in detail. OK, so first thing is the cornea. The cornea is so the anterior part of the uh, tunica fibrosa, which is completely translucent. In histology, it has altogether five layers. The anterior uh, part is covered by the corneal epithelium 
and under this epithelium you have the basement membrane of that epithelium. So corneal epithelium is a stratified squamous non-keratinizing epithelium and its basement membrane as a layer it is called the anterior limiting lamina or membrane of the uh, cornea or also is uh, called Bauman's membrane. This area is very important for several reasons. First of all, it is continuous with the conjunctival epithelium. So this is the same epithelial layer which is found around the eye. Okay, so it is the continuation of the conjunctival epithelium. This will be important since you see in this picture that there is a, a significant difference between the corneal and the conjunctival uh, layers since the corneal epithelium is located right on top of the dense connective tissue of the cornea, whereas in the conjunctiva, you have a loose connective tissue in between the epithelial layer and the surface of the sclera, which does include blood vessels. And this is the part where the enlargement of the uh, vessels is causing the so-called red eye syndrome. And if there is an injury or any other uh, medical condition in the cornea, then these blood vessels can grow this way and vascularize the cornea, which will decrease the uh, translucency. So it will disturb your vision. So you have to uh, be aware of that and you have to do your best to avoid that. Okay. Another thing about the uh, corneal epithelium is the nutrition. Since there are no blood vessels inside the cornea, uh, it's not allowed to have blood vessels since if you have blood vessels, then you have blood also inside them. And as the blood flows, it would also change the, uh, the optic uh, characteristics. So it would not necessarily uh, uh, make the uh, cornea not translucent anymore, but it would, so the blood cells would refract the uh, the light at, uh, and, and that, that would result in, in, in a blurry vision. So that's, that's not allowed. So the nutrition of the corneal epithelium, since it is in the anterior side, you have the uh, tear fluid there. So the nutrients and the oxygen is provided through the tear fluid or by the tear fluid. And this is one of the reasons why you uh, uh, should not uh, wear your uh, contact lenses for an extended period of time because that will disturb the uh, nutrition of the and mostly the oxygen supply of the corneal epithelium. OK. Next thing, it is also very densely innervated. Sensory nerves are innervating the cornea and the corneal epithelium especially. And these are C fibers, type C fibers, so non-myelinated fibers with uh, free nerve endings, which are uh, sensing um, usually pain. So most of them are pain receptors and also some touch. And the uh, reflex, the corneal reflex, which results in blinking uh, also starts from these receptors. So if something is touching the eye, let it be a large or a small object, never mind. It might be microscopic as well, so some sand or something like that in the eye. That will result in uh, in uh, in blinking or 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 just so closing the eye by the movement of the eyelids, and also will. Uh, uh, cause reflex tear production. So this is a very important thing that you have this uh, uh, innervation here. OK, underneath this epithelial layer and its basement membrane, you have a very special dense connective tissue, which is called the stroma. Uh, sorry, spelling error. That's stroma. OK, now R is missing. This is the uh, 
proper substance of the of the cornea, so it is dense connective tissue. The transparency of this dense connective tissue is uh, due to its special composition and the special arrangement. It has, just like any other uh, connective tissues, it has collagen type 1, but these collagen type 1 fibers have a special arrangement. Here you see an electron microscopic picture which compares the corneal and the scleral connective uh, tissue. In the uh, cornea, you see that most of the, or not most, all of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, collagen fibrils have the same diameter and are quite small. As compared to the sclera, where you have different diameters of the collagen bundles, which are larger. Again, another thing, the spaces in between the uh, individual collagen fibers is more or less the same. And another thing, maybe you can recognize this, but the collagen fibers more or less make layers here. Okay. So this special arrangement allows the light to go through. Obviously, it will, it will be refracted, but it can go through. So there is no absorption of light in the cornea in healthy condition. Not just the collagen fibrils and their arrangement is important, but also the um, amorphous ground substance, which is uh, very rich in proteoglycans and uh, glucosaminoglycans associated to the proteoglycans. So these are also very important for the transparency. Then layer number four and five is another epithelial tissue with its basement membrane. So you have the posterior limiting lamina or decimates membrane and the endothelium of the anterior chamber, which is a, an actual endothelial tissue, so it is a simple squamous epithelium. So that was the cornea. The sclera is regular dense connective tissue. There are structures passing through here. Several arteries and the veins pass through there. We will detail these out in the next slide. Also the optic nerve through the scribriform plate, which I mentioned already. And another important thing that the optic nerve is surrounded by the meningeal layers. So all three meningeal layers, these connective tissue capsules of the brain are following the optic nerve. So dura, arachnoid and pia mater. And this means that the space in between the pia mater and the arachnoid, this subarachnoid space, which contains the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF, this will uh, follow the optic nerve to the point where it is uh, uh, starting from the eyeball, actually. So this means that in the ophthalmologic uh, praxis, you, you have this eye ground examination, this uh, ophthalmoscopic examination, so you can see the signs of increased intracranial pressure if there is such a condition on the uh, back of the uh, so the, in this area surrounding the uh, the uh, the uh, optic nerve disc you can see edema enlargement of the vessels and and several other specific signs okay and of course the uh, extraocular muscles tendons are also piercing the sclera or inserting on the sclera So next layer, the uh, tunica vasculosa or uvea. So this is very densely vascularized connective tissue with melanocytes. And there are also some muscles inside. And very important that the connective, connective tissue of it is not only containing uh, uh, collagen fibers, but also elastic fibers. There are three parts, three main parts of the tunica vasculosa. The first part, which is the largest one, is called the choroidea. The choroidea is located here, associated to the optic part of the retina. So where the optic part of the retina is located, that's where the choroidea is found. 
the blood vessels which are contributing to the formation of this very densely uh, uh, packed uh, vessel network are those ones which are piercing the uh, sclera. So you have the following vessels. You have short posterior and long posterior ciliary arteries, and also you have anterior ciliary arteries. These make a very dense capillary bed network for the tunica vasculosa and especially for the choroidea. The uh, function of this very densely packed capillary bed is to supply the light receptors of the retina with the nutrients. So that's the main job of them. There are also veins which are draining from this capillary bed. There are two main groups, the episcleral veins to the front and the vorticos veins on the back. Histologic layers of the choroidea, you have the following layers. The first layer, which is located right below the sclera, is the supracoroid layer. The uh, other possible term for the supracoroid layer is lamina fusca sclerae, because previously it was thought that this layer was belonging to the sclera and not to the choroidea. Uh, newer data supports this idea that it is actually a part of the choroidea instead of the sclera, so the uh, correct uh, official terminology is supracoroid layer. Then you have the lamina vasculosa with larger vessels here, and then here you have the corocapillary layer, which is uh, very dense capillary layer. So there are lots of lots of capillary beds there. It is comparable with the glomerulus of the kidney, which also has lots of lots of capillaries. And the last layer is a special uh, basal lamina, which you can call the Bruch membrane or Bruch's membrane. This lamina basalis is basically the fusion of the lamina basalis of the corocapillary endothelial cells and also the first layer of the, uh, the retina, which is the pigmented epithelium. So here you can see the retina. There you can see these nuclei with some brown granulation underneath the nuclei. This is the pigmented epithelium, so the first layer of the retina, and underneath these cells are belonging to the light receptors. So you can see here that the Bruch's membrane is making the border between the choroidea and the retina, and underneath that you have the, uh, the pigmented epithelial cells. So as I already mentioned, the job of these uh, corocapillary uh, uh, networks is to supply these uh, these light receptors with the nutrients. So it's not just simply diffusion, but the uh, nutrients are taken by the, uh, the uh, pigmented epithelial cells and then transported. So basically these um, epithelial cells, these pigmented epithelial cells are feeding the uh, the uh, uh, light receptor cells, okay? In between the two basal laminas, so the lamina of the uh, capillaries and the lamina of the uh, epithelial cells, pigmented epithelial cells, you have some uh, connective tissue fibers. Most of them are elastic fibers, and this will be important. Okay. Second part, as we are moving to the front, the second part of the uh, tunica vasculosa is called the ciliary body, which will, divided, uh, will be divided into two main parts. You have the uh, orbiculus part, which in clinical terminology is called the uh, pars plana or plane part, and the plicated part or the ciliary corona, this one. The ciliary corona is... Uh, 
having ciliary processes, which are important for the production of the aqueous humor. So that fluid, this uh, 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 aqueous humor, is the fluid of the uh, eye chambers. You also have the zonular fibers originating from the uh, from the uh, plicated part, but not from the ciliary processes themselves. They are originating from the spaces in between the processes. So that's where the uh, uh, zonular fibers are. And I was already mentioning uh, quite a uh, few times that it also contains muscle. The ciliary muscle is a smooth muscle located inside the uh, ciliary body. So it is composed of ciliary bodies, composed of loose connective tissue with this uh, smooth muscle. You also have a double layer, so two layer epithelium covering its surface. The surface of the uh, body is, is located towards the middle of the eye. So the outer layer, which is closer to the ciliary body, that is pigmented. And the inner layer closer to the middle of the eye, it is not pigmented. It is a bit of contradictory at first. Why do we call the layer on top inner layer? So the reason for that is that this is closer to the middle of the eye and the, the outer layer, which is located underneath that, it will be closer to the surface of the eye. So that's why inner and outer, okay? So even though this is pigmented epithelium, actually the uh, the only the outer layer does actually contain uh, pigment. The inner layer is not. Okay, the border between the choroidea and the uh, ciliary body is called the ora serrata. This will also mark the uh, border between the optic part and the blind parts of the retina, so the nerve tissue and the pigmented epithelium part. To the front here, here you see the lens with the uh, suspensory fibers attached to it. And in front of that, you see this round shaped opening. That's the pupil and the iris surrounding it. So that iris will be the third part of the ciliary body. But before we can move on to that, let's uh, uh, have a look at uh, this picture, which is a very nice drawing about the structure of the uh, ciliary body. So here you have the level of the ora serrata. Here you have the pars plana or orbiculus. Here you have the ciliary processes and in the spaces between the processes, the origin of the uh, zonular fibers. So this is the uh, corona or pars plicata or plicated part of the uh, ciliary body. In histology, it looks like this. So this is the sclera on the outside. Here you have the uh, the uh, corona actually, and the uh, orbiculus or plane part is, is cut from the picture. There you can see the uh, epithelial layer with a outer pigmented and an inner non-pigmented epithelium. And this is where you have the uh, ciliary muscle, which has three directions of muscle fibers. And I, I am using the term muscle fibers, but you have to know that these are actually uh, bundles of individual smooth muscle cells. So it's muscle fiber is a little bit yeah, strange, but never mind. This is how you uh, call it usually. So you have three main layers of how the uh, the uh, the muscle cells are oriented. You have meridional orientation. These will originate from this part, which is called the scleral spur. Here you see a small process of the sclera penetrating into the tissue of the uh, vasculosa layer. Okay, so this is called the uh, scleral spur, and this is where the uh, muscles are attached to on their anterior end. And then they go straight in a straight line to the back where they are uh, inserting on the uh, elastic fibers of the choroidea and the Bruch's membrane especially. The importance is, is that if here the muscle is relaxed, then these elastic fibers pull the uh, muscle to the back. 
And that's why if the muscle is relaxed, then the zonular fibers are tense, are stretched. Okay, they are also contributing to the opening of the uh, so-called trabecular meshwork of the chamber ang angle here, which we will uh, talk about uh, in uh, a few minutes. You also have radial fibers, which radius, so they are pointing to the uh, middle of the eye. And the third part, which is the most important for the uh, for the accommodation, so the change in focus, the change of, of, of the increase of the optic power of the lens, the Müller's muscle, the circular fibers of the uh, ciliary muscle. So then these are contracting, then the ciliary body increases its, uh, its uh, uh, size making the anterior part of the eye uh, a bit smaller, okay? And that will relax the zonular fibers, and this will allow the lens to increase its uh, uh, anterior-posterior diameter. So the functions of the ciliary body. First of all, the ciliary processes will produce the aqueous humor. And this uh, aqueous humor is filling the chambers, both anterior and posterior chambers, and this will maintain the ocular pressure. If there is a change of the aqueous humor production, so it is produced too much, or the absorption of it in the eye, uh, uh, ang uh, chamber angle is decreased due to whatever reason, then the ocular pressure can increase, and that is causing uh, uh, severe problems. That's the condition called glaucoma. The uh, suspensory fibers of the lens, so the uh, ciliary zonule, is very important for that, and it, uh, its connection with the ciliary muscle is of equal importance. So, if the muscle is relaxed, then the fibers are tense because the elastic fibers are pulling the muscle to the outside, and then the lens is flat. This is what you can see here. So, muscle is not contracting, it's pulled to the outside to this direction. The fibers are tense, lens is flat, it's also tense, and then the uh, optic power is decreased, so the eye is focusing on far object. When the muscle is contracting like this, the fibers will be relaxed, the lens is also relaxed, it will be more round in shape, so increased anterior-posterior diameter, and that's when it increases its optic power, so it is focusing on a close object, on near object, and that's what you call accommodation. Okay. And the third thing, which is a more clinical um, relation, is that you have no actual important structures in the uh, orbiculus part or pars plana of the uh, ciliary body. So that's where you can give injections into the eye, which you can uh, call intravitreal injections, or during an operation, you can safely cut the eyeball open in that area without, of, uh, without the risk of injuring something important. Third part of the tunica vasculosa, the iris. It has two ends, a pupillary margin and a ciliary margin. It has an anterior surface and a posterior surface. The anterior surface has uh, dense fibrocytes as cover. This is one of the exceptions where a surface is not covered by a continuous epithelial tissue. So there is no continuous epithelial layer on the anterior uh, surface, only fibrocytes. Then you have a stroma of the uh, iris, which is just like the other parts of the uh, of the tunica vasculosa, is made of loose connective tissue with some uh, blood vessels and, uh, and uh, melanocytes, and it also does contain muscle. There are two muscles here. The actual smooth muscle tissue is belonging to the sphincter pupillae muscle, whereas from the posterior uh, part, 
you have myoepithelial cells or myoepithelial processes of the pigmented epithelium, which make the dilator pupillae muscle. So true smooth muscle is the sphincter, myoepithelium is the dilator. Let's go back to the, uh, to the melanocytes. All parts of the tunica vasculosa had melanocytes. The most amount of melanocytes were present in the uh, choroidea. This is very important because from these melanocytes, you can also have melanoma. And if you think about this, melanoma has a tendency to give metastasis very early on. So there are melanocytes which can transform into melanoma close to a rich, densely packed vessel network. So that is basically a deadly disease. Ocular melanoma, as it is discovered, then your body is full of metastasis only. So there is just simply no chance of surviving this disease, unfortunately. So melanoma, if, if it's not caught very, very early on, uh, it's, it's, it's not a, not a curable uh, cancer type. So that's, a, I guess we can call it a bad design. Okay. So let's take a closer look at this uh, posterior surface. So here you have the uh, iris part of the uh, retina. So double layer pigmented epithelium with both layers pigmented. And the anterior or outer layer is having these uh, myoepithelial uh, processes which make the dilator pupillae. So dilator pupillae muscle has sympathetic innervation and the dilation of the pupillae is called midriasis. The uh, smooth muscle here at the uh, pupillary margin is called sphincter pupillae muscle. It has parasympathetic innervation and its uh, uh, contraction results in the constriction of the pupil, which you call meiosis. The actual pupillary margin is made by the reflection of the uh, pigmented epithelium. So the outer layer is reflected into the inner layer, and this is overlapping the stroma a little bit here. The last part of today's lecture will cover the, uh, the uh, chambers. So the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber. So posterior chamber is located in between the lens and the uh, posterior surface of the iris, and it is also related to the ciliary processes. Anterior chamber between the anterior surface of iris and the uh, backside of the cornea. This area here, is called the chamber angle. So here you have the cornea and sclera transition, and here you have the uh, ciliary body iris transition. And in this area, you have the so-called chamber angle where the fluid, the aqueous uh, humor, will be absorbed through a trabecular meshwork, which you can also call the spongiosa, so spongy part of the sclera. Here, this trabecular meshwork is composed of two main parts, obviously. You have the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the trabecules and the spaces in between. The trabeculae are made by uh, collagen and elastic fibers and they are covered by endothelial cells. And the spaces in between are called the uh, fontana spaces. The uh, trabeculae closest to the iris are called the pectinate ligament of the irigocornea angle. This makes the first layer, and you have two more layers of the trabecular meshwork. You don't need to know the details of this. And then finally, you have the so-called Schlems canal. This Schlems canal is basically a special vein made by a cavity of the dense connective tissue here with endothelial lining. This is where the uh, fluid is absorbed into. So the fluid is drained into the Schlems canal through the Fontana spaces of this trabecular meshwork. So to summarize this again, so here you have the ciliary body with the ciliary processes. 
that's where the aqueous humor will be produced. So it first the fluid first flows in the direction of the posterior chamber. Then here through this little uh, gap between the lens and the pupillary margin of the iris, it passes through the pupil and then fills the anterior chamber. Through the anterior chamber, it flows laterally to the chamber angle and then through the fontana spaces of the trabecular meshwork, it will be drained into the uh, Schlems canal and then will be taken by the so-called episcleral veins. Okay, so that's how the uh, fluid is produced and then drained back into the blood. Okay, so this concludes the uh, first part of the uh, visual system. Tomorrow we will cover the uh, other parts of the eye. So we will talk about the lens, we will talk about the uh, vitreous body, and we will also cover some uh, aspects of the uh, development of the eye and also the uh, the uh, accessory organs. Okay, so Paul Pebra.